person to pray and to seek God. Isn't it great to be able to fit into your faith shoes and your faith clothing? If you've been around a little while, you've heard me say this before. This is, my, this is one of my suits that is the end of the closet. You know, you don't need to get at because you're weighing too much. And uh, you say, by faith, um, one day I'm going to fit in. You know, women, you know what I'm talking about. One day, by faith, I'm going to fit into that dress. But you know what I learned? You need to put faith. You need to have not just faith, but you have to have works. Oh, come on. Somebody say amen. You know where I'm going with that. I could have all the faith, but until I, until I started to put works to it by fasting, praise the Lord, I'm in my faith suit. You re- you don't have to, women, you don't have to go buy no more, you know, new, new dresses. Just just have some faith and works. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay, open up in your Bibles this morning. And I do want to conclude this message with a time of prayer around the altars and a time of just uh, believing God. I've entitled my message this morning, Look to the Promise. Look to the Promise. I want to breed, I want to impart uh, encouragement to you. I want you to understand something this morning. The Christian life was never meant to be lived from an earthly perspective. The Christian life was never meant to be lived from an earthly perspective. It was never earth to heaven. It's heaven to earth. That's why Jesus said, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the perspective to have, the the, the vantage point, the perspective to see things from God's point of view. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the word of God tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See how important it is? You know, I was just thinking of this uh, this week, uh, unrelated to the message, but it came to me, you know, how, how critically important it is that you and I, well, I was thinking for myself, I need to keep renewing my mind. I, 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 you know, we, we are bombarded with messages, with images, with, 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 with advertisement, if you will, messages that are coming at us. Images, TV, Twitter, social media, constantly. And then our our own inner self-talk. You know what that is when you talk to yourself? Come on, please admit that you do talk to yourself. Don't admit that you talk back to yourself. Just, Just admit that you talk to yourself because we all do. And our minds are constantly hearing these messages. And I don't, I can't fathom. I can't comprehend. I don't understand some Christian who think church is optional, who think reading the Bible is optional, who think fellowship is optional. I can't comprehend that because all that I do, not forget about being a pastor, just as a a child of God, as a Christian, I need the Word of God. I need the Holy Spirit. I need prayer because I'm bombarded in my mind, and I don't know how people think they can live an overcoming life and live the the life that God intends for us to live just by, you know, getting by, just by doing a little bit. Come on, how many of you are with me this morning? Be, do not be conformed. That word in the Greek means don't be pressed in to the mold of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be pressed into the mold. You know, the molds are changing so fast. We can't even keep up with, 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 with culture, with styles, with, with programming, with, with uh, uh, internet, and, 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 and all the world is changing. But it's constantly trying to exert an influence on the believer, on the child of God, trying to get it to squeeze into its mold. But the Bible clearly says, do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed. Come on, somebody say amen. You've got to make up for the person that's not sitting next to you this morning. So living the Christian life means you live from a different, different perspective. Heaven's perspective. And understand something this morning. When you come into alignment with God's perspective, 
things will begin to change in your life. I said things will begin to change powerfully in your life. We are in the midst of prayer and fasting. I believe that prayer and fasting are powerful, powerful uh, weapons in our spiritual arsenal. They are powerful, powerful disciplines in our spiritual uh, devotional life because prayer and fasting helps, helps to tune out the world and fine-tune our spiritual ears to hear God's perspective. See, that's what I'm trying to tell you this morning. We need to hear God's perspective. Prayer and fasting helps to fine-tune our ears to hear. Jesus said in two places, in Mark chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus said, take heed what you hear. Take heed, be aware of what you're hearing, because he's, he's saying that not everything you hear is worth hearing or worthy of your attention. He says, take heed what you hear. Be careful. Don't listen to everything. The Bible tells us that, that we are to discern the spirits. For not every spirit is of God. Not every vision, every dream is of God. You've got to discern through the word of God. That's why we push. That's why. Where did it go? Where did that Bible go? Oh, here it is. <laughs> That's why we push this. We're not making money on this. This isn't a fundraiser. This is a tool to get into your hand, to get your mind renewed, to get you here, what, to take heed to what you hear. As I was looking at it, I noticed in Luke 8, verse 18, Jesus said, take heed how you hear. In one occurrence, or one gospel, what you hear and how? Is there a contradiction? No, I believe he said both of them. Take heed what you hear, but then also how you hear it. Come on, now you're listening to me this morning. Because you could be sitting some, next to someone who's hearing the same thing you're hearing, but getting a different message. And I'm, I don't mean in a good way. Oh, come on, somebody somebody say amen, because I'm, I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. I had someone just this week tell me, you know, someone was so offended, they thought I was preaching at them last week. Oh, my Lord, I says, praise God, I want to preach at everybody. And I didn't even have, uh, God knows my heart, and God knows the truth. I didn't, I, just, I didn't even know if I knew they were here. I surely, I can say confidently, 110%, I was not even thinking of them one iota before, during, or after, until I was told. But somebody got offended because I was preaching the word at them, and they took offense. See, that's a problem. Be, take heed how, how you hear. Don't hear with a skewed vision. Don't hear with, with a negativity. Don't hear uh, how you heard in your other church. Oh, come on. I'm, I'm. Don't hear with a perspective because, oh, the pastor's shoes are too shiny this morning. And I'm offended because he's got nice shoes. God, grow up and get over it. <laughs> oh, the pastor's got a new lease. Praise God, I spent less than you spent, I'm sure. The things we allow, be careful what you hear and how you hear. Are you hearing, the Bible says, receive the word of God with meekness. That means humility. That means you receive the word of God, not with offense, not with an attitude. Because you know what? If you have an offense and an attitude, you will be offended. And you know what? The Lord will make sure you are. You say, really, Pastor? I think you didn't hear what you said. I heard what I said. Jesus said about the parables. He says, the word that I speak, I speak parables so, so it will be a stumbling block to those who really don't want to believe. So they'll hear and not hear, see and not see, because the heart of his people has grown dull. But I don't want to be dull. I don't want to hear and not hear or see and not see. I want to hear from God's perspective. Turn to the person next to you. Say, I'm done with low living. Come on, I want to hear God's perspective. So, Pastor, where are you going this morning? I'm glad you asked. I'm trying to encourage you to align with God's perspective. I want you this morning during this fast to enlarge your perspective. 
I want you to enlarge your paradigm. I want you to expand your vision. You see, we, want, we need to get a new point of view from God's perspective. Readjust, refocus, refuel, refire. I'm trusting that in 2017 we'll sh- see a shift in the atmosphere over the church and over our lives. Hallelujah. I'm trusting that, that if, we, if we all come into alignment with God's perspective, we, we, we know God will do it. We know he, He's faithful to His word. Turn with me to, to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. We are in the first book of the Bible. You should be able to find that rather quickly. Genesis chapter 15. Listen, I want you to learn the word of God. I'm passionate about the Bible. I don't want to just preach to your, to your emotions. You know, I don't want to just get you excited, although preachers do like to get people excited and, and responsive. But I also want to preach to your mind. Amen? Uh, it, it is important. You know, I don't think it's either or. You know, I don't think a preacher should just get you excited. I think a preacher should get you thinking. Amen? And so I want you to learn things. And, and I study the Word of God, and, and I want you to build into your life the habits and the disciplines and the desire to learn more of the Word of God. Genesis 15 would be, and and this is a little tidbit here that I'm trying to help you to learn and understand, this would be the reestablishing or the reinstituting of the covenant that God made with Abraham. God first made his covenant with Abraham. This is the beginning of the Jewish nation. This is the beginning of the Israelite, the the people of God. And this is critical in the plan and the purpose of God because God's desire to communicate and to bring his message was first and foremost through Abraham and his descendants. And ultimately, the, the, the Savior, the Messiah, would come through the lineage of Abraham. And so in Genesis chapter 12, we have the establishing or the initiating of the covenant where God appears to Abraham and said, get up, get thee out from thy con- country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house and I'll show you, I'll place you, I will take you to a new place and I will bless you and you will be a blessing and, and, and through you the nations of the world would be blessed. We're blessed today because of Abraham. Amen. Amen? We're blessed because Abraham believed God, one person, and he was called. He believed God so much. You know, faith pleases and blesses the heart of God so much. How do I know that? Because Abraham believed God. And you know what it says in James about him? It says he believed God, and it was accounted unto him to righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Whew, that's powerful. You know, some people like to hobnob and say, you know, my friend is, or drop names, you know, I know so-and-so, and I know so-and-so, name is so-and-so, so that. But to be a friend of God, now that's big time. Come on, that's epic. Come on, that's big news. When To be a friend of God, to be a friend of God, and Abraham, through his faith, through his obedience, became uh, 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 the forerunner or the, or the one, the example of the father of faith for all those who believe in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So that happens in Genesis chapter 12. At that point, Abraham is 75 years old. And here we have in Genesis chapter 15, we have what would be considered the, the reinstituting or the renewing of that covenant. It's critically, critically important because this is God's plan and his design for the nation of Israel, but for the nations, plural, of the world, for the Gentiles, for every people group. And here in Genesis chapter 15, Abraham is 85 years old. Turn with me if you're not there already. Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham or Abram in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. 
Then Abraham said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my ear. And behold, the word of the Lord came to them, saying, This one shall not be your ear, but one who will come from your own body shall be your ear. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said, So shall your descendants be. Verse 6, and one of the powerful Old Testament verses of Scripture, Abraham believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Hallelujah. Here we see God coming to Abraham with a fresh word. God coming to Abraham with a fresh promise. You see, Abraham needed to hear a fresh word from God. You know, time to time, you and I, we need to hear a fresh word from God. Now, I'm talking about those times when we're in prayer, those times we're sitting in a, in a sermon or hearing a sermon, those times when we're meditating upon the Word of God, and the Word of God becomes so real to us. It becomes nourishment. It becomes strength. It becomes a blessing to our lives. Andre Crouch wrote that song many years ago. He said, we need to hear from you, Lord. We need a word from you. If we don't hear from you, Lord, what will we do? He said, people are dying. People are perishing. Lord, we need a word from you. Hallelujah. And God comes to Abraham. And, and, and what's interesting, I want you to understand something. I want you to look at the context. Where was Abraham? Not, not necessarily uh, geographically or what land. He was, in, he was in the promised land. He hadn't inhabited it yet. But uh, where was Abraham? What was he dwelling in? Let me give you a hint. Some of you think it said a very tender place. Where was he dwelling? He was dwelling in a tent. He didn't have um, a castle. He didn't have a, 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 bra, a brick, brick uh, block. What do you get when you cross a brick and a block? Uh, he didn't have a block building. He had, he had a tent. He was dwelling in a tent. Now, now, God comes to Abraham right where he's living, right where he's at. See, God comes to Abraham and he enters into his dwelling, right where he's living, in his tent. How many of you know God knows where you're dwelling? How many of you know God knows right where you live? He knows your address. You know, from time to time we send out, whether it's a, a mail, a snail mail card or some correspondence from the church, and we'll get, we'll get, usually we get a stack back, you know, and it's undeliverable. No address, no such address, or no such person. And I think either because the person writes in tongues, and we don't have the interpretation for tongues, so we don't get it right, or they didn't give us the right address. There's something wrong, but, but regardless, the, the point I'm trying to say is that God knows your address. God knows exactly where you live. God knows exactly what's going on in your life. And he comes to Abraham. And he says to Abraham, fear not. Now the question is, why would God say to Abraham, fear not? Well, if you look and we're students of the word of God, what does verse 1 say? After these things. So we look back and we say, after what things? Isn't that simple Bible study, uh, hermeneutical principles, technique, studying the Bible? What is, what is after these things? So we look back to chapter 14 and we see that Abraham was involved with, with a skirmish, his, his uh, lot was captured, and, and he went after, and he fought off four kings, and, and he, re, he, he recovered the slaves or the servants that were stolen, and he recovered the goods, and, and he defeated four kings. But how many of you know those kings, uh, they want, might want revenge? How many of you know those kings might want to come back and, 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 and be reinforced and, and, and come at Abraham again? Abraham had been in a battle, but how many of you know sometimes you might subdue your spiritual enemies, but they don't, they're not fully dead? Come on, they come back after you. And, and here's Abraham, he's, he's in this place, and God doesn't say fear not unless there's a reason. So he says to Abraham, fear not, do not be afraid. So God comes to encourage him. God says to Abraham, look what God says to Abraham in verse 1. I am your shield 
What does that mean? I'm your protector. You were just in a battle, but I got your back. You were just being uh, 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 in a skirmish with these kings and in a battle with these kings, but you know what? I am your shield. I'm the one who's going to protect you. And he also says, I am your great reward. Praise God. You see, he's telling them that I'm your shield, I'm your protector, because Abraham needed to know that. You need to know today in your life, in your world, God is still your protector. The Bible says that a thousand may fall at your right hand and ten thousand at your left, but it shall not come near you. You need to, you need to grab a hold of that promise and you need to, to claim it. See, see, the word of God doesn't work unless you work it. I said the word of God doesn't work unless you work it. That means you have to quote that verse. You have to declare that verse. I'm telling you, if you've got a lazy spirit on you, it don't work in the workplace, and it surely don't work in the spiritual realm. Come on, somebody say amen. You need to shake off that lethargy, and you need to get vigilant, and you need to say, you know what, I'm going to declare the word. I shall live and not die. I shall be blessed. I shall be favored by God, not just once, but every day, every opportunity opportunity you get because you are fighting against principalities and powers that are trying to thwart the plan and the purpose of God in your life just like they were in Abraham's life and he came to this he came to encouragement I'm your shield and I'm your great reward he comes to Abraham and he says Abraham I'm your reward now listen that doesn't sound too exciting you know, maybe your spouse tried to find a, the perfect Christmas gift for you and couldn't find it, so put a bow on his or her head and said, Honey, I couldn't find the gift that you wanted, but I'm your gift. I'm sure you'd be really excited about that. But God was saying to, to he was saying to Abraham, I'm your reward. I'm your reward. You see, when you have God, you can have nothing, but you have everything when you have God. If you have everything but you don't have God, you've got nothing. I am your reward, Abraham. I am your reward. I'm your promise. And you see, you know, uh, here we have, where is Abraham when God's telling him this? Where is Abraham? He's in the tent. He's in the place of his limitation. He's in the place of, of his restricted or, or his lack, if you will. And God comes right into his place of limitation in that tent. And God comes to Abraham. And God comes to encourage him right where he's at. Hallelujah. I'm glad God still comes to encourage us right where we are at. Remember Elijah after he gained that great victory on Mount Carmel? Those of us that went to Israel, we stood at that point that vantage point in Israel, that Mount Carmel, what an amazing sight. And, 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 and Elijah, he, he won the battle against the false prophets. He built an altar, called down fire from heaven. One of the greatest miracles in the Old Testament. And just a few days later, what happens? Elijah's running in fear, and he finds himself in a cave, and he's depressed, and he's discouraged, and he's ready to quit life. He even tells the Lord, God, take my life. You know what God said to him? Elijah, what are you doing here? You notice God didn't say, what are you doing there? Oh, I don't think you got that this morning. He says, what are you doing here? In other words, I'm right here with you. Hallelujah. I'm right here with you in your discouragement, in your despondency, in your lack, in your need. God's saying, what are you doing here? And so God comes to Abraham, he comes into his tent, and he tells him, listen, I know where you're at, I know you're fearful, I know you're discouraged, but I am your shield, and I am your exceeding great reward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. What a promise. What a promise. Hallelujah. Now, now, listen. Here's God coming to him, and and maybe some of you are just as excited as Abraham was. You would think that Abraham in his tent, when he heard the Lord say to him, 
hallelujah, I'm your shield and I'm your reward, Abraham. You would have thought, hallelujah, Abraham would have took off running around in his tent. You would have thought he would have been shouting the victory. Stay right there. Look what Abraham says. But Abraham said, but Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I am childless, and the heir of my house is, is Eliezer of Damascus. You see, here is Abraham, and you can sense the disappointment and the frustration in his life. I love the word of God. I love the truth. The Bible is rich. It's alive. It's full of relevancy. See, Abraham, Abraham was, was you could sense the, the, the disappointment. In the frustration. He, it was as, it was as if he was saying, God, yes, I know I have you, but but what a, I, I got you, but where are the blessings? Or, or where are Oh Lord, don't we do that sometimes? You know, when we're first saved, we're just so happy to be saved. Come on, can you remember that far back? When you're first saved, you're just so happy to have your sins forgiven. To, to be born again, to know that you know that you know the truth of God. You're just so blessed and don't care, I mean, what you have. When I was first born again, I, I, I just was so radically saved and, 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 and disciple that, that I, I want, you know, almost want, you want to live like John the Baptist. You know, I remember I had a, back then, it was a 1970, no, it was 1981 I was saved. I had a 1977 uh, keyboard. It wasn't really anything fancy. It might have cost three or four thousand, but I felt like it was too shiny. Now you might not understand this, but just humor me and stay with me. So I sold it to buy a Dodge Duster, rust color, that was 1974. And I drove around in that thing. You would think I was driving around in a, a Mercedes Benz. Or I was driving around. What's that guy's name that does that commercial for the uh, Lincoln Continental? Matthew McConaughey. McConaughey. <laughs> you might think, uh, because you know what? I was saved. I had the Lord. I was driving down the road. It didn't matter. See, because I didn't need. My identity was in who I was in Jesus. And I knew that I knew that I knew I was, I was so excited. Now, am I saying you have to sell your car and go buy a junk? To, forgive me if you, have, you drive a Dodge Duster right now. No offense, but that was, I don't think you have a 1974. That'd be worth money now. But, but see, see, but we get to a point, God, oh, God comes to us and blesses us with his presence. And he, he meets us. At, but, but God, it's like Abraham, well, it's not enough, God. But what about? I don't have a child. What about, I don't have this. What about, I don't have that. You see, for Abraham, now let's, 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 let's enter into his world and maybe help you and I connect with the word of God. Abraham has been waiting 10 years and he has an unfulfilled promise. A decade. Decade has gone by. 10 years. God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. And anyone who blesses you, I will bless. Anyone who curses you, I will curse. I will make you a blessing to the nations of the world. And here, 10 years go by and nothing. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get to that place. You know how many prophecies I've heard over my life? You know, over this church, how many times have you been to a convention? And got a prophetic word. How many times have you heard a word from God? A prophecy. And, and you get to the place where you're saying, God, thank you, but no thank you. Oh, come on. I don't know if you're with me this morning. Get to a place you say, but God, you said it, but I don't see it. God, you've, you've, you've given me a word. I don't want another word. It's too long. It's taken too hard. It's, it's too hard. I don't want to wait any longer. Ten years. Not fulfilled. He gets discouraged. I like what Warren Wearsby said. He said, a basic lesson in the school of faith. God's will must be fulfilled in God's way and in God's time. Let me say that again. This is a basic lesson in the school of faith by Warren Wearsby. God's will must be fulfilled in God's way and in God's time. What happens is we want God's will in our way and in our time.
look at Abraham. Abraham, what's Abraham and God telling him this? He's in his tent. He's in his tent. And, and the Lord is with him. And you know, I, I, look, look at God. Look, look at the word of God again. Verse, verse 3. And Abraham said, look, look God. He says, I've been waiting 10 years. Look God, I don't have a child. And God says, oh, thank you for letting me in on that. What a revelation. Imagine Abraham saying, God, look. God, look, look what's going on in my life. I know you don't do that. I know we're not guilty of that, but there are times when we say, God, can't you see? And, and I'm sure God came down, or God's with him in the, in the tent and saying, oh, wow, you know what? Scrap all those promises I gave you. <laughs> they, they won't work. You know, your, your, your situation's too impossible. Look, God. I'm glad, I'm glad God's merciful and gracious because, you know, have you ever talked to your kids and you tell them, listen, they say, no, listen to me. You say, no, you listen to me and slap him upside the head. I'm telling you, you ought to worship and thank God because he is merciful and he is gracious and his mercies endure forever. Amen. See, for Abraham, he was at a place in his life where the, the Proverbs tells us hope deferred makes the heart sink sick. You see, I want something to change in your life. I want something to shift in this atmosphere. I want to see a breakthrough in Victory Assembly of God. God, where is the promise? I have no child. I have no ear but Eliezer. But God says, listen, don't look at your problems. I want you to look to the promise. I want you to look to the promise. So what does God do? God says, come on, Abraham. He grabs him by the hand and he says, come on, get out of your place of limitation. Come on, get out of your place of, of insecurity, your place of liability. Come on, get out of that place. And he brings Abraham out of his tent, and he says, now I want you to look. No, you said look to me. No, 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 you don't tell me to look. I tell you to look. Lift up your eyes. Look at the promise. Hallelujah. I want you to look at the stars. Come on, somebody get a hold of the word of God this morning. Somebody, I don't know, I don't know some of you got to shake off something in Jesus' name. Come on, that's why we need a breakthrough in Jesus' name. Come on, I know you know the word. I know you got it in you, but it's got to come out of you. Faith has got to come alive. There's got to be a spark. There's got to be the fire of God that comes upon our lives because we need a living and vital relationship with God. If we're going to win the lost, if we're going to see the church of Jesus grow, it's not going to be proselytizing other church members, but it's going to be because we so powerfully present the gospel and demonstrate the power. Come on, I'm talking about the power of God. You see, I, be I still believe that God could heal people. I still believe that by the laying on of hands, demons could come out of people. I still believe that people who are bound could be set free. There are some people that are so bound, they really don't want to be bound. They want to be set free, but they're addicted. They're, 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 they're bound up by the enemy, and the power of God needs to come upon them. How many of you remember what it was like to be touched by God? How many of you remember what God can do? And so I got to believe, I, I, I still believe that, that in 2017, the rush of the, the, the Holy Spirit wants to, to come into this place. I know what it is, and I know what it isn't. Hello? I know what God can do. I know what it's like when God comes in. I remember distinct times in our church's short 27-year history where God moved by His feet. Where the presence and the power of God, uh, it, it was, it was a just, it was, a, it was just as if the flow of God was there. God, when God just shows up, and see, I believe for us here this morning, hear me, hear me well. Take heed to what you hear, and take heed to how you hear. Lift up your eyes. Look to the promise this morning, not your problem. Come on, look to the Lord, not your lack. Oh, I wish I had someone to come and agree with me. So God takes Abraham, takes him out. He said, I want you to lift up your eyes, and I want you to look at the stars. See if you can number them, Abraham. And he says, so shall your descendants be. Now, that's mind-blowing. That's, that's mind-boggling. Abraham doesn't even have one child. 
Abraham doesn't even have his, his, his descending yet. He doesn't even have one child yet. He doesn't have that promise, one child. And God's saying, look, I want you to look at the stars. And I want you to realize, you know what? So shall your descendants be. You know what that makes me think of? Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. According to the power that works within us. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, can we not believe for such an increase? Hallelujah. I says, can I? I know you've I know you've had setbacks. That's why I'm preaching this message. I know you've had unfulfilled promises. That's why I'm preaching this message. I know you've been waiting 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. That's why I'm preaching this message. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See what we need to have done. We, God has to do it. Because it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. I remember starting the church and just, I couldn't wait till we get to 50 people. 50 people would be awesome. Come on, you don't think I'm pleased. You don't think for one moment that's easy. Most of the churches in America, 80 something percent are under 60 or 70 people. Now, almost 9 out of 10. It's not easy. And then I told, once we hit 50, God, you could do it again, 100. If we can just three digits. Wow, 100 people. That would be awesome. Then we grew to 100. God, if you can just get us out of this storefront. We needed to, to raise thousands of dollars. You know what happened one Sunday morning? The Holy Spirit moved. People began to stand up. I'll give 500. I'll give 300. I'll give 1,000. And just and it was a move of the Spirit. There was no coercing. Uh, it, it just happened. We didn't even orchestrate it. And I think over 10, 12, 15,000 came in in a storefront with just a handful of people. The Holy Spirit moved on. That's God. That's what we need this morning. Not what you could produce. Not what I could produce. But what God could produce. Then we said, God, we need a bigger building. We raised the money, and then we went into our second building, and it was awesome. And God, if we can just get to 150. And you know what? We went into that new building, and we had like 1,500, 1,520, and we grew to 95. We lost some people along the way. God, how can this be? We just got into this building. We got to pay the bills. And God, how in the world are we going to do it? You know what? God did it. God did it. We grew. We grew. We grew to a point. We have to have two services now. And you know what it was? It wasn't me. Praise the Lord. I can say that. God, hear what I'm saying? I'm humbling myself. Lift me up, God. Help me, God. Anoint me again, Lord. What was it? It was the anointing, the Spirit of God. Every service, every service. Now, I would, maybe not every nine out of ten services, I didn't have to coerce anybody to worship. What changed? People just worshipped. People ran to the altar. I didn't have to tell them to come to the altars. And it wasn't just women. Come on, men, where are you this morning? People came. People prayed. People sought God. We had pre-service prayer meetings. I had preachers come from other nations that got so inspired. Other countries, when they came and they saw what God was doing, they said, i got to go back and do this in my church. We had 30, 40, 50 people on a Wednesday night crying out to God. Not, not this meditative prayer. Not, please, there's nothing wrong with meditative prayer. But it's once in a while, you've got to open up your mouth. And you've got to cry out to God. You've got to call out to God. And we'd have 30, 40, 50 people on a Wednesday night. I don't know, maybe they didn't work. I'm being facetious. Maybe, maybe they didn't have kids. Maybe, maybe they never got sick. Maybe they, I don't know, but they were there. It was something God was doing. We need to see that again. And you see, it's not. And, and Abraham, you know what the Bible says? Abraham, now what am I, let me sum this all together. Abraham, he, the Romans chapter 4 gives us the, 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 the interpretation or the New Testament context of, of an Old Testament passage. And the Bible says that, that Abraham, he, he looked to God. He looked to the one who calls things that are not. As though they were. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says Abraham, he staggered not. King James language translated. He wavered not 
at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith. I want you to be strengthened in faith this morning. He was strengthened in faith. What did he do? He gave God glory. Why? Because he was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Understand something this morning. What God has promised, he is able to perform. Only he is able to perform it. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by God's spirit that the miracles happen, that the provisions happen, that the heavens are open. It's God's doing. And that's who we ought to be, brothers and sisters. We ought to be people of the spirit, people of the Holy Spirit. People who are alive and vibrant, not with human emotion, not with human discipline or human strength, but with the touch of the Holy Spirit of God. That's why Paul said, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. It's the Spirit's empowerment that makes us to be. You might have a promise 10 years, 20 years in the waiting. Don't give up. I want you to still believe today. You might have had some setbacks and some discouragements, you know, and, and, and let me get back to my illustration about the church. And, and, you know, sometimes different ministries, oh, if we could just have 10 people, oh, that would be great. Praise the Lord. I'm just believing for 10 people. Praise God, but can we up it? Amen? Come on, our church game, come to a place, can we break through some barriers? Not for the sake, I'm not trying to impress anybody, but there are souls. That need to be one to Jesus Christ. There's a lost world that needs the gospel. That's our mission. That's our co-mission. That's what God has called us to be about. We're not a bless me club. We're not a pub just to come and feel good and have all nice relationships and just go home. We, that's part of it. But we've come here to be energized and empowered to go out and reach people. To go out and minister to people. To go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me this morning? Would you stand with me today? I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. I still believe. I still believe this morning you might be settling for so much less. Well, if our church can just grow to this number. Who said that? Well, numbers are not important. Oh, yeah, God wrote a whole book. <laughs> Called them numbers. Amen. Why, why do we count people? Because people count. Amen? Praise God. In your, in your life, you have a promise from God. And if you believe, there's no telling what God can do. God says to Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward. And you say, well, what good is that? Well, in Romans chapter 8, it says, he who freely gave up his son for us on the cross, how will he not freely with him give us all things? If, he gave, if God gave us his all, that means he gave us his all. We got everything we need to live godly, to live righteous, to live overcoming lives. I don't care what your experience has been to this point. It doesn't have to be the same way. Come on, let's look at it from God's perspective. Let's look at it from a different perspective. Would you come move out of your seats this morning and with faith, I said with faith, come on, put some works to your faith. Say, I'm going to move out. And you know what? Can we believe that in our church services, the power of God can be released, that souls can be saved, not people just making decisions. I'm tired of people just raising their hand. I'm talking about people who want to follow Jesus. When I was born again, I, I, I didn't need anybody calling me every other day to come to church. Hello? I, I just wanted to be in church four times a week, and I was a teenager. Figure that one out. That's God. When God touches your life, we need the touch again. Brothers and sisters, you've known God. One burden I have before we sing this song tied to this message is, you know what? The Bible says in Joshua, or Judges, the beginning with Judges, another generation arose when the elders, when Joshua died and the elders of Israel died. The Bible says another generation arose who did not know the Lord nor his power. And you know what the next verse says? They set their hearts to do evil. When the people, when the next generation that's coming behind us doesn't know God and the power. Now understand, they were Israelites. They were taught and trained. They knew, they knew of the word. They didn't know it personally because they had the Bible. They had the prophets. What that meant was they didn't know experientially the Lord and they didn't experience his power 
like the Israelite, like like Josh and Leon. Red Sea parted. Jordan opening up. Come on, we've had those experiences, brothers and sisters, that hear and understand. You and I have children that, that don't know the power of God. They don't know. How will they know unless you and I rise up? Rise up. Think about that. If 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 we're not here, you know, I, I think of the future. Another pastor comes after me. Is he going to have the passion to call the church to prayer and fasting? I'm not saying this to puff myself up. I'm saying this, I wonder, what are we living in a generation, in a day and age where this is almost antiquated? This is like dinosaur era. You know, we're into a hip hip culture now where you just be cool in church. Come on, I'm talking about the Bible. The the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. The Bible. Come on, God wants to raise up young people filled with the Holy Spirit who believe. I wish that God would raise up out of the youth group some prophets, some evangelists with the touch of God that want to come to these altars and lay hands on people. Pastor, can I pray with you? Pastor, who can I go visit? Pastor, I believe God wants to say. They just have a fire and a passion. Can we believe God? God's going to do that. I can't. You can't. He can. Come on, lift your eyes up. Come on, let's look to the promise this morning. Come on, let you know what the Bible says? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He kept on believing. That word in the Hebrew speaks of a continuous sense. He kept on believing. Will you keep on believing this morning? Will you keep on believing? Let's sing it. Let's, let's close this with prayer. Come on, let's come back to the house of God tonight. Let's believe this fast is going to break open the heavens. the dead to hear right now your blood takes away the curse 